And so that's when I say modern roots. What I mean is, is that we're taking the modern aspects of how we do it now and bringing back the roots from that we've always, you know, played from. They're not exposed to adults playing, then as far as they're concerned, they're learning language that nobody else speaks. Production of immense possibilities is made possible by the generous support of the Earth and Humanity Foundation. Wendy Selden. Rogue Co-ops, a community-centered collaboration among the Ashland Food Co-op, the Grange Co-op, Rogue Credit Union, and the Medford Food Co-op, Cliff Bar and Company, Elizabeth York, and these additional members of the Immense Possibilities Community Builders Circle. Welcome to our weekly visit with people who are creating immense possibilities for healthy communities, solutions to all kinds of challenges. If you walk the hallways of most public schools these days, there's a sound you won't hear that most of us over 30 or so heard just about every day when we were young students. It's the sometimes sweet, sometimes jangly sound of kids learning to sing and play instruments. There are still things about the benefits of music instruction we don't know about. We do know it makes a decisive difference. The growing mountain of scientific research evidences clearly the inherent value of music training. It literally creates a success blueprint in developing the young mind of the musical artist. Not to mention the strengthening of such personal attributes as commitment and dedication and persistence and a strong work ethic. What better preparation for life's challenges could there possibly be? In a recent Gallup poll survey, an astounding 95% of Americans believe that music is a part of a well-rounded education. And 93% feel schools should offer music instruction as part of the regular curriculum. And yet, when public school budgets are tight, which these days pretty much means always, music instruction is very often the first to go. Tonight we meet people who care deeply about music and care deeply about kids and work very hard to put and keep the two of them together. My first guest is Dee Fretwell, founder of the Modern Roots Foundation. Dee, welcome to Immense Possibilities. Thank you. Tell us about the Modern Roots Foundation. Why did you get it started? Yeah, um, the Modern Roots Foundation is an organization designed to uh, financially support kids getting into music lessons. And I started it kind of for a number of reasons, but really at the heart of it, it's to connect kids to music and give them a tangible way to um, just express themselves. Music uh, instruction outside the school for kids whose families likely wouldn't be able to afford it otherwise. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now we've heard some on this program about academic studies, about the effect of music instruction on child development, all of that. You personally, what do you see? and what have you found about the impact of music instruction on kids? Uh, a couple of years ago, when we first started attending this bluegrass festival, we dropped off our daughter at this um, youth academy, and we basically shoved her into a room with another 150 strangers, um, these kids who were going to, and we promised her they'd come back really you know, evolved and, and changed and different. And she really skeptically, carefully walked into the room, and, and we left her there for a couple of days. <laughs> and at the end of it, we saw her stand on the stage with another 100 plus kids perform in front of almost 1,000 people. And she, this confidence that she radiated was just incredible. And all of the kids, you know, ranging from ages five up to 13, it was incredible. And it stuck with her. Absolutely, oh yeah. You know, I, she's still not the most uh, uh, vivacious kid out there. She's still shy, but her confidence level has changed in the way that she holds herself you know, in public is different. You know, there is a battle going on this very day in thousands, maybe millions of households between parents and young children about music and the need to stick with their lessons. I had it growing up and I didn't stick with it. My folks said, you're gonna be sorry if you don't. I said, too bad, I'm giving it up. And they were right, I was sorry. 
What's your insight about that difficulty, or the difficulty of getting some kids to persevere with music, to see it through, to get to the point where it's really enjoyable for them? You know, I think that we can all find a reason to not do something, and finding the right instrument and the right instructor um, will help with that. You know, and just being able to be in a community of other kids who want to play, and then their friends play as well. And so it kind of creates this culture of playing versus this very strict, formal, you know, you're going to beat them with a stick if they don't play the piano or practice. Doing it with other kids is pretty important then. Oh, it's huge. Yeah, it's the same thing for us as adults, right? We all want to be around our peers, and we're around like-minded friends. That's, they want that too. You know, one thing that strikes me is that you're not asking these instructors to work for free. You're raising money to pay them a fee for their professional services. What do they think of this program? Oh, they're happy, they're excited. I mean, it's not just job security, it's actually building the movement that they passionately work towards and work for. Um, and I, I, I am very adamant when I'm doing my fundraising to explain that I do pay the instructors because I need them around. And if they give it for free, they're not gonna be able to afford doing that. And they're definitely not making a, a killing you know, doing this for a living. You call yourself the Modern Roots Foundation. Tell us about the roots part of that. Yeah, it's my, uh, my paying homage to a genre of music that I think is um, extremely important. And I think that it's a, a genre of music that really helps to cultivate and define that kind of community-based playing. And so that's when I say modern roots, what I mean is, is that we're taking the modern aspects of how we do it now and bringing back the roots from that we've always, you know, played from. How can someone who's watching right now plug in with you? What are the opportunities? You know, um, there's a couple different ways. If they want to volunteer at one of our fundraising events or become a sponsor, businesses will do that quite often. Uh, they can also just make a direct donation, which is the easiest, uh, fastest way to help, help kids out. What most feeds you personally about doing this work? I think ultimately what really drives me is watching those kids on stage. Um, it's just incredible, you know, just watching them express themselves. And in a world where we're completely coded with technology, the ability to just sit down and tangibly connect with other people. I mean, music is the universal language. So. Dee Fretwell is the founder of the Modern Roots Foundation. Dee, thanks for what you created. Thanks for coming here to tell us about it. Thanks, Jeff. I'm Rainy. Rainy? Leela. Leela. And your sisters? Yeah. 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 Who's the oldest? Me. I love playing music, so it's really fun. And I generally try to play my best in any setting. It's, it's, it's this very fun thing to do, and it's a career path that, you know, I could follow. It brings people joy, and they really they like to hear music. Our next guest has everything he can to spread the roots down to the next generation. He's Dwayne Whitcomb, who plays several stringed instruments at home and on stage and with youngsters pretty much wherever he can. Dwayne joins me now along with Kayla Fennell, a sophomore at Ashland High School and one of his music students. Dwayne, Kayla, welcome to Immense Possibilities. Thank you. Now you have kids who play uh, really well. Did you start them really early and I wonder did you do it out of sort of a theoretical sense that music was good for kids or just because they were there and the instruments were there and you were there and it seemed like a fun thing to do? I designed my program for a, uh, a very strong-willed young boy, which was my son. When I wanted to have something that would uh, appeal to somebody uh, like him and that would make him want to play just because this is what my friends are doing and, you know, I didn't want, I wanted to have something that required very low parent capital investment that they didn't have to spend you know, effort on saying, now go practice. Is it gonna make a big difference if one of the parents is enjoying and playing music themselves? Oh, huge. You know, in the uh, early stages, they're, they're getting the, uh, the, the signals that this is something that we do throughout the rest of our life. And if their parents are playing, that, that reinforces that. If the parents don't do anything musical or if they, they're not exposed to adults playing, then as far as they're concerned, they're learning language that nobody else speaks. 
It's, it's something like, do as I say, not as I do, which is never very effective. Yeah, yeah. You started something called Creekside Fiddle Camp. Tell us about that. Well, I suppose I'm a, I'm a big fan of making sure that we keep music uh, sort of in a, in a context that uh, is relevant to kids' lives and is a much more uh, of a social experience as not just a performance experience, but something that kids can get together and, and do without having a prearranged format. And uh, it's something that is as easy as a pickup game of basketball and uh, kids feel as comfortable and willing to do. And it was just a, uh, a way to get kids out in the summertime uh, in the park playing music. And uh, I began that about eight years ago. I think Kayla was one of my first uh, campers there. And uh, it's grown into a really uh, effective program where kids come for uh, two or three camps uh, that last a week. Well, I wanna meet Kayla. Kayla, welcome and tell us how and when and why you got started with music. I was at a barn dance in second grade and it was absolutely amazing and I loved the violinist. So I absolutely begged my mom, tell me, please, please let me play. Was it a child or an adult fiddler? It was an adult. And that, what was it about it that really got you? He was in charge and I was one of those little kids that liked being in charge. Now, fiddle is not something you pick up overnight. There's a lot of practice to do. Yeah. All, most of us have heard beginning fiddlers and we know that. So did you stick with it the whole time, every single day? Or were there times where you said, I don't want to do this anymore? What was I thinking? Uh, th yeah, there are definitely times where I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. But my mom's like, you really will regret this. But if you don't want to do it, that's absolutely fine. What was the key that made you keep with it? I really liked lessons. Lessons are incredible. You get to meet with this older person who's kind of cool, and you get to play these cool songs. And she said, you don't have to practice, but we have to practice to have lessons. And that was a huge motivating factor. What would you say to uh, someone your age or younger who's really struggling with the discipline of staying with it and who wants to quit? It gets better. It really does. The more you do it, the better you are and the more opportunities you have. I'm in a band now and I play with my friends. And you can't necessarily do that when you're just beginning, but as you get older, you can, and it's really worth it. You have fewer of those times when you say, why am I doing this? Yes. You know, grown-ups like to talk about the benefits the music has for kids beyond just learning the music and being a musician. What are your ideas about that? What would you say about benefits that aren't immediately obvious about the discipline of learning an instrument and becoming good at it? I think it really teaches really good study habits and habits that you can take with you everywhere and also it's a lot like playing a sport. You have a discipline, you do it, you get good at it and you have goals and it really helps you set easy goals that, nah, easy is not really a good way, but achievable goals and that you can carry with it throughout your life. You are part of the Grizzly Fiddler program. Tell us a little bit about that. So the idea is we meet once a week and I'll meet individually with one kid for 10 minutes. And my job is to help them learn whatever song they're on currently. So if there's a really tricky spot or something, we can go over that together. It's really, really fun. And I like having the relationship with the kid and I really relate to them. Like, I know exactly how hard this is. And I really like seeing them succeed and seeing how happy it makes them. More importantly is developing mentoring relationships between the young ones and the, uh, and the older kids. And you know, if you're gonna be teaching scales the next day to uh, a younger child, you better get uh, pretty good yourself. That's right. Now we hear that music is much easier to learn when you're a young child and that makes all kinds of sense. And I wonder if it sometimes discourages adults who want to get into an instrument for the first time. Can you say something encouraging to adults who might think it's too late for them? <laughs> well I think that uh, it's important to understand that you don't have to be an expert in something to enjoy it. And um, I think what makes kids be able to uh, uh, be such good students is that they have lower expectations of proficiency. So I have adults that uh, have picked up the violin and, you know, after 40, and they have a lot of fun with it. And they play songs that are relevant to them, they enjoy, and that they can fit in in social circles. Um, but once people start hitting about 10, 11 years old, they become more self-conscious and they, they get more frustrated when things don't go quite there, you know, they're not perfecting it. So beyond just the different brain neurology of youngsters and adults, it's that um, willingness to be frustrated, not to have to succeed, not be too judgmental of yourself, that's the difference here. 
Yeah, entirely, I think. I mean, I, I feel like that I've met enough adult musicians that started the violin when they were an adult, and they play wonderfully. And uh, so it's entirely physically possible. I think that we do take up a lot of energy when we have uh, that self-talk of, oh, I can't do this, this is too hard. And so the energy that you know, kids don't spend, they spend it on, oh, I'm going to try that again. Dwayne Whitcomb and Kayla Fennell, thanks for joining us today. Will you take us out of this segment with a fiddle tune, one of your fiddle tunes? Happy to. Well, just give us a moment to set this up. Dwayne Whitcomb and Kayla Fennell with a little bit of Fisher's Hornpipe. One, two, three. We have someone with us tonight who's just as dedicated to spreading the joys of music, but works at the other end of the generational range. He is Donnie Rose, and he created a nonprofit called Heart and Hope Music. Donnie, welcome to Immense Possibilities. Thank you, Jeff. What was your creation for sharing music, and how did it come about? My mother-in-law, uh, Annabelle Gherkin, lived with Kate and I uh, for a while, and we took care of her. And then she needed to move to an adult foster care home. And uh, various times that she moved, I went and played for her. And it just seemed like a, a good, good move in, into this. When my school teaching uh, came to an end, I moved right into this. It wasn't a, it wasn't a big jump. It just feels like it was, uh, what it, doesn't everybody love music? Doesn't everybody hear music all the time? And don't they have their favorite songs? Well, how does the healing uh, play out in, in elder homes, in the places you go to play? Uh, I want to tell you a story about this guy named Cecil. I went to an adult foster care home. I used to go there every week, and uh, Cecil was there. And I came in this time. There's five elders in the, in the place. And Cecil was uh, laying on one of those uh, Barca loungers all and he had the, he had the uh, tubes in his nose, and he was, looked like he was ready to fly away right then. So we played a few songs, and I knew one of the songs that he liked. And he used to be a dancer, a ballroom dancer, when he was young. And he taught all of his daughters and all of his granddaughters how to dance. And I, so I knew what song to play, and I started playing Alexander's Ragtime Band. And his, his feet started moving, and his, his uh, sandals, his... Uh, you know, his slippers fell off, and uh, he opened his eyes, and he turned to his granddaughter and he said, I want to dance. So his granddaughter got up, and they got him up out of the chair, took the tubes out of his nose, and uh, we got somebody behind him, a caregiver behind him, as well as in front of him, his granddaughter in front of him, and they danced around for the whole tune. Uh, and I'd say that's healing. I'd say that was uh, a miraculous occasion because that was him, and that, that's what music can do. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. Always know, dear, how much I love you, because I will tell you every day. Shave the haircut. It's nice. Three bits. <laughs> Have you ever had one of the residents uh, go ahead and reach for the instrument themselves and want to play? I have, actually. Uh, and uh, I, I usually allow them to try to do it if it's possible, you know, at some point. Does anything surprising ever happen when you play for people with memory loss? There's one woman I play for. 
Her name is Louise. And uh, the first time I ever played for her, she couldn't talk, hadn't talked since her stroke. Uh, and her uh, brother who take, took care of her was sitting in the, in, you know, in the room. It was an overcast day. And I kind of was wondering, what should I play? I was kind of asking, what should I play? And what came to me is, oh, what a beautiful morning. It wasn't a beautiful morning, but that's what came to me. And so I took out the guitar after meeting her and introducing myself. Uh, I started playing the song. The sun came all of a sudden, started coming through the window, and everything turned bright in the room, and we started singing. And she sang the whole song all the way through. This is somebody who couldn't talk and sang the whole song all the way through. Uh, and her brother started, you know, broke down and started crying because of it. I'm sure you've been asked this before, Donnie, but what keeps you so devoted, so energized, so passionate about this work? I, I try to give joy, and it seems like that's what I'm, I'm just made to do. I'm made to do this, and uh, I get it back. I get it right back. Love is something that you give, and when you give, you know, I think it's a universal law. You do receive. So I feel like uh, uh, it's a relationship. I have relationships with these people, and uh, it's, it's quite wonderful. Donnie, will you play us a tune to take us out? You bet. What are you going to play? Sunny Side of the Street. And that's a good example of the kind of vintage tunes that you play. You bet. Songs that people already know and love and make connections with. Grab your coat and get your hat. Leave your worries on the doorstep. Just direct your feet to the sunny side of the street. Oh, can you hear the bitter pat and the happy tune in your step? Life could be so sweet on the sunny side of the street. I used to walk in the shade with those blues on the rain. But I am not afraid This a rover crossed over If I never had a sin I'd be rich as Rockefeller Gold dust at my feet On the sunny side of the street I wasn't too many people invited out there to dance. Move back to furniture and pull up the carpet and just have a big time. With dances like this one, Bascom rekindled the spirit and skill of mountain dancing. But there were some preachers, teachers, and parents who considered all this sinful, fearing the contests would foster drinking, fighting. But the dances never stopped. Fellows continued to square off and compete at buck dancing, as much for the benefit of the ladies as anything else. Bascom paid his critics no mind, hovering among the dancers, watching like a hawk for new talent, taking note of who pleased the crowd.
were just more or less watching each other. When he'd change steps, I would, or he would go into a step and I'd go into something completely different. It sounded like this. I ain't barely do a few steps there. Then I'm gonna join with it and get a little sound going with it here. And that's it for this edition of Immense Possibilities. You can find more information or give us suggestions at immensepossibilities.org. Visit our Facebook page and like and share us there. Thanks very much for watching. I'm Jeff Golden. Until next time, please do what you can do. Thanks for watching to learn about tonight's immense possibility. You can watch any of our past programs anytime at immensepossibilities.org.